it's always a test they the ulama say for three types of people right mm -hmm. especially where there's oppression involved first and foremost we don't necessarily just want to fix the problem for the sake of the problem no we want to first and foremost have an excuse before allah you know sometimes you'll see with in the muslim community they will say hey we have crisis mode fatigue there is always another crisis and so the way that they deal with it psychologically is just to turn off to tune out it's like okay i know this is a huge issue but they just don't want to deal with it anymore uh, the first thing i would say is understand the level of the oppression we're talking about yeah. i never actually became a fully focused activist for the uyghurs until i just started looking in a lot more detail at what is happening uh, obviously everyone is going to do things for their own reasons and i think I, again it's important for muslims to realize the reasons why we are doing what we are doing in the first place no i'm not worried at all i rely on god allah on behalf of the lifehug team thank you for watching this video and for more clips and beneficial content, please subscribe to the Lifehug channel, your number one source for personal Islamic development. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Welcome to our next session, a Uyghur Community Action Plan. We have two uh, guest speakers with us. Uh, we have Dr. Salman and Ustad Sabur. Jazak khair for joining us. I want to get right into the crux of the matter because this is a very important issue and uh, I really want our community to be mobilized in terms of trying to put consistent effort to get uh, some type of effective change, inshallah ta'ala. So, Jazam uh, khair, assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh to both of you. Welcome to the CDC conference. Wa alaikum assalam wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. So, uh, before we start discussing, um, uh, Dr. Salman, I, I don't know if you, um, uh, you know, remember back in the days when you were coming up, uh, there's a lot of energy, you know, when you first get into, uh, you know, university studies and things like that. And uh, we were involved, I remember when I was growing up, um, a lot of activism in regards to the Palestinian issue, in regards to the war in Iraq and if, uh, Afghanistan and things like that. Um, and uh, nowadays, what we notice is that um, there is a lot of activity, at least on social media and uh, in uh, you know Western culture. There's a lot of activism that's going on, and uh, oftentimes uh, Muslims do get wrapped up in a lot of these different activist causes. Why is the case for the Yuga, uh important, and we need to give priority and focus on that? Uh, first, uh, thanks for the invitation. Uh, the brother told me that they, you know, there's going to be a lot of nice refreshments in this conference. So mm. I forgot it was going to be uh, online. So. Oh, I, I'm I'm having it for you. I'm having it for you, <laughs> doctor. So I've got I've got some, uh, alhamdulillah. But uh, you raise a good question. Um, yeah. I mean, look, when whenever there's Whenever some crisis happens, right, whether it's the mm -hmm. Uyghur issue, the Rohingya, the Kashmir, Afghanistan, Syria, Yemen, the list goes on, subhanAllah. It's always a test, they, the ulama say, for three types of people, right, mm -hmm. especially where there's oppression involved. The, 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 first, the, 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 the first type of person who it's a tribulation for is the actual oppressor himself, you know, he or she mm -hmm. is you know uh if you look at it from our paradigm he or she is um going further and further and further into destruction themselves in this life and the next second type of person is the person who's actually being oppressed you know the person whose uh rights that allah gave them are being uh transgressed but the third type of person it's a test for is us it's the spectators it's the onlookers and that's why it's very important um, to remember that shaitan will try and make us think well you're not doing the oppression or it's not happening to you directly so why don't you focus on something else and the reason why we need to resist that is because of our very important principle in our deen which is 
Al-Maysur la yasqut bil ma'sur. Just because there's something is, uh, something is difficult, right? Something outside of your control, you and I can't, you know, mm. completely end the oppression of the Uyghurs or the Palestinians or whatever. But what we can do is um, certain things. We can speak out against it, for example. We can do the things that Sabu is going to talk about, for example, inshallah. Mm. Um, and it's important for us to look at it from our own perspective because some people and many people especially non muslims when they kind of they want they see something wrong and their fitra tells them this thing is wrong many people get kind of disillusioned because their starting point isn't necessarily an islamic one their starting point is we want to fix the problem but yes. our starting point i would argue is first and foremost we don't necessarily just want to fix the problem for the sake of the problem no we want to first and foremost have an excuse before Allah that at least mm. we can tell Allah, look, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, you gave me this opportunity. You know, if I had an army on, on my disposal or whatever, if I was the head of state, I would be questioned about those big things. But I'm mm. going to be asked about what? You had a voice, you were able to, you know, write a letter, you were able to share something, and there's some actual genuine kind of things that we can do. We'll be asked about those things. Yeah, and this is a this is a golden principle in our deen that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala you know, he judges us according to what he's given us. Not the, the output, for example, necessarily, but you had this ability, what did you do with the ability that you were given? And this should be mm. our frame of reference, I believe. So when it comes to certain things that on our doorstep, you know, you can train certain things, you're going to be asked about those things. When it comes to things far away, it doesn't give us the license to just ignore it. Mm. Rather, those things we can do, we will be held responsible for doing or not doing. And this mm. is a bit tough to talk about because it brings a bit, a bit of moral anxiety, right? Mm. It makes us feel, well, wait a second, what do you mean? Oh, I have to just quit my job and just work on this issue. Mm. Um, it's a tough one, but the mm. point we're trying to get across is we have to have it on our radar and, and resist that temptation from Shaitan that don't talk about those things because they, and even our nafs will automatically block certain things out because they bring us a sense of moral anxiety, a sense of duty, sense of feeling guilty maybe, right? Mm. Um, and we really have to resist the kind of the conditioning that we've received when it comes to how we look at Islam and activism and so forth. If I give mm. an example, right? If people, I, don't, I can see the chat box if anyone wants to answer or you uh, answer this question. And close your eyes and imagine there's a there's a, an overtly identifiably Muslim person on, on TV, right, on, on the news. Uh, mm -hmm. Big beard, robes, you know, nice turban or hat or something. You know, he's clearly a Muslim, he's a practicing Muslim. What is he talking about? Mm -hmm. uh, what's the, you know, the first thing that comes into your mind that why, why is this guy on the, on, the, uh, on the news? Maybe he's mm -hmm. talking about halal meat. Maybe mm -hmm. he's talking about Islamic issues. Mm. or counter-terrorism policy or whatever but many of us we don't think necessarily automatically that maybe he's talking about you know oppression maybe he's mm. talking about a healthcare policy in your country mm. maybe he's think maybe he's talking about why the bins aren't collected frequently enough or something right mm. because we whether we like it or not many of us me including, including myself we absorbed mm. the image of what an islamic Islamic person is from somebody else from a different tradition mm. uh, from the European tradition for example now, if, if I ask you who's the most Islamic person who's the most righteous God-fearing pious person Muslim right now, we know they're the, the prophets and the Sahaba for example mm. but we might automatically think maybe it's someone living in a monastery or a, a hermit somewhere you know wandering the jungle eating leaves you know, mm. being one with Allah. But if you look at the actual blueprints we've been given, mm. who were the highest Iman Muslims, the most pious Muslims? They were also generals, they were also khulafa, they mm. were also scholars, they were also mujahideen, they were also businessmen, for example. Mm. Right. So we have to get out of this mindset that, you know, why is it, why would it be odd for us to be talking about the the Uyghur issue or the or any mm. issue, any issue? This is a like a general preamble, right? Yeah. When it comes to the Uyghurs, there are certain things that we're not going to be asked about by Allah Subhanahu wa Taala. Allah is not necessarily going to ask us why didn't you, 
you know, invade the, that region and, and free them. If mm. you are maybe the head of a country, you've got massive armies that you're just, well, maybe he'll ask you that. But he, me, me and you, what's he going to ask us? And there are certain things that, you know, it's very good. Uh, Sabur has a very good, you know, uh, his, his finger on the pulse, you know, mm. as to what we want to do. But just a few things, for example, that we can mm. genuinely do, that we have a, a response for Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Number one, we can make dua. And we don't want to belittle this. Right? As alongside mm. taking all of the, uh, just an example, alongside taking all of the means that we will see, inshallah, dua is free for us. But how many of us make dua for our brothers and sisters who are being oppressed? Right? Yes. Hey, you and my brothers and sisters. How many, mm. I mean, the masjids are closed in many parts of the world, but do, are we doing, are we encouraging our imams to do qunut al nazila? Right? The, mm. the, the special type of qunut when there's a, there's a crisis happening in the ummah. Are we, and this is the dua is a legitimate means to an end in our world view, right? Doesn't mean mm. we just put our feet up and not doing anything else, but dua in, interestingly, the Prophet ﷺ in the famous hadith when he said, Man ra'a min karan fal Whoever sees among you, whoever sees a, a, something condemnable, let him change it with his hand. If he's unable to change it with his heart, uh, if he's unable to change it with his hand, then let him change it with his tongue. And if he's mm. unable to change it with his tongue, let him change it with his heart yeah mm. and that's the there's no fourth choice that's for a muslim that is the lowest for a, for, a, for a believer right? lowest level of iman yeah but mm. how do you change something with your heart <laughs> mm. right? one of the ways is you sincerely feel that you wish you could do something else. i mean none of us are at that point by the way we're all able to speak out against it Right, the ulama when they, when they explain these things, what they say, what does it mean to not be able to do that? It means you can't do that without making the issue worse, by like getting your head chopped off or whatever, or making the problem worse. None of us are prevented from using our tongues, for example. But dua is a very, very important one. Uh, in addition to that, right, something very important that we often overlook is one thing we can do is give moral support to our brothers and sisters. Hmm. Yes. We, one of the, the, the traps of shaitan is when our brothers and sisters are being oppressed and they see maybe Muslim leaders or politicians not, not you know, doing their bit according to their perspective, many of them are justified in that feeling, they might feel the ummah has kind of just left us, betrayed us or they don't care about us. Each and every one of us can find people online, can give some messages of support and can, you know, be creative, can, can, uh, put events on, can get our children to write kind of uh, poems or, or letters or whatever to get that moral support across because we shouldn't underestimate the impact that that has for our brothers and sisters. Even Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, He gave moral support to the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa on so many occasions. Yeah. Mm. Noon. Yeah. مَا أَنْتَ بِنِعْمَةِ رَبِّكَ بِمَجْنُونَ وَإِنَّكَ لَعَلَىٰ خُلُقٍ عَظِيمٌ وَإِنَّكَ, وإن لك لعجل غير ممنون. Noon, Allah mm. is swearing by Noon, by the, the pens and what they write. You are not by the blessing of your Lord a madman. They're calling mm. this and that. I'm telling you, you're not a madman. But you have the, you have, uh, you have the highest level of, 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 of moral character. You, have, you will have an unending reward. Right? Allah mm. is giving the, the purest heart this, this consolation and, and moral support. Mm. What about us, now, brothers and sisters? What, what can we, you know, what can we stand to benefit from that solidarity? Right. I, I think you've de deconstructed a lot of the internal excuses people give themselves um, uh, th that uh, really prevents them from doing anything. You know, for for, for an issue such as so great as this. Uh, you know, um, you know. Sometimes you'll see with in the Muslim community. They will say, "Hey, we have crisis mode fatigue. There is always another crisis, and so the way that they deal with it psychologically is just to turn off, to tune out. It's like, okay, I know this is a huge issue, but they just don't want to deal with it anymore, or they give such a high level of power, and it is a very powerful and oppressive regime. You know, uh, we've seen uh, them even in their antagonism with the United States." Uh, you know, U United States doesn't deal with them the same way that they will deal with Yemen, for example, or a country or any, uh, you know, some other countries, right? So 
there's that hesitation. You see the UN, for example, uh, suddenly forget the name of Taiwan, you know, <laughs> in, in interviews because of the fear that they have of the power of China. But I think what you really contextualized for every single Muslim is what is the origin, what is the reasoning, what is the paradigm you base anything upon? And it's not necessarily that result. And uh, you made some very powerful comments about even words to show I am with you. You know, uh, that is tr tremendous amount of support. Like if you've ever visited anybody who's suffering or on their deathbed or suffering from cancer in the hospital, and they'll tell you what words mean when people's kind words, the effect that it has, you know, for them when they're in such a state of despair. So I think you've deconstructed a lot of hesitations that people have because it is sometimes easy to get involved with woke activism because the extent of your activism is just liking, sharing, uh, you know, the little heart button, you know, things like that. And it's very easy to feel satisfied that there was some type of result that I attained from this. So I want to pivot to uh, Brother Sabur to talk about what are some of the actionable, pragmatic steps our com the communities, the Muslim communities in the West can take as a leadership role and not have to wait for this issue to be popularized in Western culture uh, for us to make a start making a difference. So, Brother Savour, I would like to get your insight uh, into that. Jazakallah khair. And I'd like to thank the organizers for uh, inviting us to um, this very important discussion. Bismillah. So, I mean, you raised a very important point, which is that we shouldn't wait for, you know, something to be woke or something to be in before we realize uh, how important it is. I think the first thing is uh, I want to take it back to something I think which uh, I think most of us here can relate to. So uh, I'm sure we all have children um, or we have nephews or nieces. Um, you know, even before you have children of your own, there's always a nephew or a niece who's your favorite. You always take care of them and, you know, you're, you're their favorite sort of relative. Um, so I, I just want to highlight something. If you go online and you put in um, parent lost child and, and you get these CCTV footages where some parent has lost their child and sometimes it's literally a case of within a few minutes they've lost their child and they found the child. But you see mm. their expression, you see their pain, you see their anguish, you see an incredible amount of trauma. And uh, what is different about the brutality with which this cruel and evil regime is, um, you know, showing its true colors in uh, Chinese occupied East Turkestan is that it is separating children from the parents. I mean, I, I totally understand. And I, I mean, I, I've directly spoken to women who've been raped uh, in these camps, but I'm sorry to say, we, we have to sort of put that in one level of a, one level of pain and the pain of losing your child at another level, because that, I mean, it, it is the worst type of pain, right? You would mm. rather die. You'd rather be raped. You'd rather be tortured. You'd rather have your nails ripped out, which by the way, some of the uh, interviewees um, have actually said that some of the women, when they come back from being gang raped, their na their fingernails are missing. Some are bitten, and there's all sorts of sick things that happen to them. Mm. So, uh, the first thing I would say is understand the level of the oppression. We're talking about literally hundreds of thousands of children separated from their parents. Right? We're talking mm. about a huge, huge number. We're not talking about small numbers here. We're speaking of on the minimum tens of thousands the most conservative estimates will still be tens of thousands and it's not like your child's just going over to uh you know your your some some friendly han chinese family they're going over to a a indoctrination to make sure they do not mm. believe in allah anymore and if you're a father um with teenage daughters uh, the risk is here not only rape but forcible marriage with Han Chinese men. So that the first action point, which cannot be underestimated, 
um, is of course, like Salman said, du'a. But before you make a du'a, you also need to know what, what is going on. Mm. I'll be very honest with you guys. I always use, I mean, since 2011, I've been hearing about the Uyghur issues. 2011, right? Yeah. I never actually became a fully focused activist for the Uyghurs until I just started looking in a lot more detail at what is happening. Because when you look at a surface level, you mm. hear X, Y, Z, and that's already a motive. When you actually start researching it, you find out this is another level of oppression. It's possibly the worst mm. oppression of Muslims in the last hundred years. Think about somebody in a, a conflict zone. They're killed. That's it. Mm. It's better to be killed than to have your children missing, right? Anybody yeah. who's a parent knows that. Even is better. And, and Sabur, I want I want to just take a moment here just to pause for people for that to sink in. Because when you're saying tens of thousands, you know, we're so accustomed to these huge number of losses in the Ummah that it just become digits. Behind every digit, there's a face, there are tears, and there's pain. Every single digit, you know? So they're not just like numbers that, you know, oh, wow, what a huge number. Because I want people to really connect with the, the face behind every single number that you're, that when you say 10,000, if you can, I can you even fathom uh, thinking about 10,000 faces suffering right now. Uh, go ahead, Sibor. Absolutely. And if you if you go online, you'll find videos where parents who are in a different country and their children have been taken to concentration camps. Because sometimes what happens is the father is away to work, to earn money. Mm -hmm. And then the wife and the children are put into concentration camps and orphanages. He doesn't know where his wife is. And he hasn't spoken to his child in like over a year and he randomly finds his child in a chinese propaganda video and the guy is literally crying his eyes out and almost his head is bursting with tears because his child is repeating the communist party narrative mm. in a random video he just saw his own child mm. right so the thing is look we need to obviously take action. Now, there's many different things we can do. We can firstly um, affect our legislators, right? The, the people who um, uh, make the, the the sort of policies in the country. Now, um, I really like what uh, what um, uh, Salman was saying earlier, uh, just about activism and yourself as well. We're, we're not just there to make noise and share and like and, and post. Mm -hmm. The real difference comes when your local representatives in parliament, they know that the people who put them in power, the voters, they are not going to be happy if they don't support them in firstly calling it a genocide. Now, every country is different. Um, Canada, alhamdulillah, from my understanding, has declared this a genocide. Other countries have not. Now the next step is um, look at what IPAC is doing. This is what you guys really got to do, right? Alhamdulillah, most of the work has been done for us in terms of clarity, mm. not the actual what needs to be done, but clarity. IPAC, the Interparliamentary Alliance on China, they're made up of parliamentary parliamentarians all over the world from opposing parties, mm. and they are working to cut off the the um, economic and intellectual ties between the Western world and China mm. uh, in uh, in regards to um, uh, uh, the the link that the Chinese Communist Party has with certain companies which are complicit in oppression, not just mm. of the Uyghurs but the Hong Kong and the Manchus and Mongolians and Hong mm. Kong and everybody, right? So all we got to do is every single country scenario is different. For example, in the UK we have a trade amendment bill. In another country, we have something else. You just got to look at what is IPAC doing mm. in your country? There's all, always actions going out regularly. Follow those actions. That's mm. the easiest thing you can do, right? Yes. Secondly, find out. I mean, most of us, alhamdulillah, in the Western world as Muslims, we've, we've been to university or um, we're at university or we have family members who've graduated from university. That pretty much covers everybody. Mm -hmm. Take the names of um, uh, your. Uh, take the names from uh, the, one of the recent videos I did with Muhammad Hijab on my channel. Uh, my channel is the same as my name, and there you'll find a list of Chinese companies which are banned, right? Okay. But universities are still working with them, mm. and 
what you do is, of course, you've got countries like uh, Huawei on there and Dahua and others. Um, interestingly, some openly, uh, uh, you know, openly linked to the Chinese military. And you got to start contacting your student union, your, your university representatives and saying what, mm -hmm. what's going on. You can email us on research at ufo.ngo. Um, so that's the Uyghur Freedom Organization. Uh, our website, ufo.ngo, you can also go there to actually uh, contact us for more support. And uh, so that's the second thing, that we got to cut off the supply line uh, of China in terms of... And, and by the way, guys, this is very important. Mm. Uh, I'm, I'm just going to uh, put it out there. It seems a bit odd when you hear that hundreds of thousands of students are studying in Canada, in Europe, in, uh, you know, in America, in Australia. Why? Mm. It's very strange when you hear about it, that mm. that many Chinese students, the latest mm. estimates that I've heard is 600,000 Chinese students study wow. abroad, right? The reason is because their level of education is poor compared to the Western world. Mm. And they're desperate. I'm going to repeat that word. They're desperate for Western technology. We can cut off that technology mm. by telling the universities, you guys care about pronouns. Why don't you care about persecution? Mm. Right. You, you, you know, you're very pedantic about these details, but you're not, you don't seem to care. And, and this is happening right here in London. We have Imperial College London, one of the most prestigious universities, not in the country, but the world. And this university, which is very woke and, you know, you have all these movements. Mm. Most of the students don't know that they're directly working with Huawei, which has has designed facial tech facial technologies to actually discriminate against Uyghurs, which helps the Chinese government catch mm. them and put them in concentration camps. So Alhamdulillah, you know, there's been some success with uh, the deal uh, with Imperial and, and Huawei in terms of trying to stop it. Um, so yeah, that's, that's the other things. Cut off the supply line when it comes to universities. And the third thing, which is the most important, is generally sharing everything right mm. on social media you guys you know i'm sure everybody here including my myself can attest to when was the first time you heard about the uyghurs when did you find this out when did you find that out is because somebody else shared it on social media yes and when you share it and you repost it you, you i mean i've i've given myself a rule that i post about the uyghurs at least once a day twitter facebook whatever it is you know just once a day just just make that intention and it adds up, mm. it goes quite far. So those are some practical steps. Mm. Um, and even though I only laid out three basic things, um, I would say the first thing which I mentioned, which is IPAC. Mm. What is IPAC doing in your country? Mm. That's something that's gonna take, you know, that's for the heavy hitters, that's for the activists who really are, are deadly serious about this, right? And wanna mm. invest some time. Point number two is again, requires a bit of time. Point number three, everybody can do. Literally yes. everybody can do it. And uh, yeah. we literally have no excuse if we don't do it. And if you can reach out and, and speak with these people personally, I, I would also encourage that as to build off the social media sharing. Uh, you know, we, we were kind of uh, aware of the Uyghur issue, um, again, early uh, 2010, uh, because we actually had a brother amongst us, you know, uh, who has, uh, you know, roots from back there. And he was traumatized. Like you talked to him. He is forever traumatized. They talked. He talked about how his father was tortured, and they cut out his eye. And uh, you, when you actually dealt with his brother, you you saw him living every day with that trauma, even though he was your years and re he was years removed from that situation, and it was more more coming from what his father endured. You know, so uh, I I actually on top of the social media, if you can talk to some of these people directly it has a completely different type of uh, impact uh, i think this is the first step towards um doing these types of collaborations and bringing awareness to this issue uh, we are going to post the details of a lot of these practical steps on social media uh, so that people can have reference to that and inshallah we hope like because we just had a united islam awareness week we have a good link with a lot of the universities across Canada and this action plan, actually, we intend to share it with the universities all across Canada, inshallah. And hopefully we can take the mantle to bring that change. You know, when you look at uh, what's popularized, like, you know, people, people are more in the West 
concerned about what happened to Meghan Markle than they are in regards to the uh, to the suffering of the Uyghur. Uh, you know, absolutely, absolutely. And so, sorry to cut you off. I just yeah, wanted no. to add something which I completely forgot to mention. Yeah. Canada is a key country mm. when it comes to Chinese uh, investment, Chinese relationship with universities, mm. and. China, uh, and, and Canada is a lot. I mean, you, you got to think of it from this perspective. America is the number one enemy of China. Mm. However, the Canadian government, despite what um, you know, de despite them labeling this a particular genocide and and all those types of things, you have to remember that mm. they, their hands are kind of tied when it comes to the universities that that are dealing directly with China. Mm. So there is actually a lot of work to do and China, uh, sorry, Canada is a very strategic country. Mm. If we can get a lot of the MSAs all across um, Canada on this, this is some very serious consequences for the Chinese Communist Party. If we can get some, you know, uh, some, some, some energy uh, into cutting off the supply line, mm -hmm. uh, in intellectual supply line, that is for the Chinese Communist Party, there's even... Um, there's even some very deep military links, but again, I don't want to get into some. Um, uh, well, I'm not really sure if you're aware of this, but uh, the the Chinese government is holding two Canadians hostage right now. They're like they're two white guys, and they're basically keeping them as pawns because of the executive from Huawei that uh, we had detained here in Canada and stuff like that. So. There's already this pre-existing tension that's happening, you know, here in the Canadian government, which actually facilitates them, like, paying more attention to this. Because now they're seeing that, hey, our own citizens are being, uh, you know, dealt with in, in certain ways. So um, I, I think Canada can play a significant role. Uh, obviously, everyone is going to do things for their own reasons. And I think, again, it's important for Muslims to realize the reasons why we are doing what we are doing in the first place. Um, it's upon us. It's like your brother, your sister. You have the greatest responsibility to stand up for that. And if you're waiting for somebody else to do that, it's like nobody's going to go into your house. Do you expect somebody to come to your house and provide for your family and pay the bills and, you know, fix up, you know, the fence, whatever? You have to take it's your household. It's your house. You know, we need to take the mantle and we need to uh, take responsibility, inshallah. So um, I thank you, brothers, uh, immensely for this. It's an important issue. And uh, we, uh, you know, we hope that this is just the beginning of like uh, some collaboration and coordination for such righteous causes, inshallah ta'ala. So once again, Jazam khair, brothers, for uh, sharing uh, your time and the information and the experience with all of us. Assalamu alaikum. Do I feel that the New York police are providing enough protection or do I have to have protection of my own? I look for protection from Allah.